All right, what is up, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube? Austin and China coming at you live. Originally, this live stream was going to be on a bunch of other people's channels, but there was a, uh, a snafu. Let's call it a snafu. And um, it's just on my channel. So um, we're going to wait and let everyone come in first. Um, let's see. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and add them in right about now. Okay, so uh, first up, we've got kind of our leader, the guy who had the idea for this particular live stream. His name is uh, Simon. He's based in Nanjing, and he wanted to talk about, uh, you know, speaking Chinese and learning Chinese in China. So let's add Simon into the mix. Hey guys. Hey Austin, how you doing? Yeah, pretty good, man. All right. So that's just one. And then next up we've got Lawrence, who is uh another Chengdu guy. He's made a couple of videos here in Chengdu. And uh he's got uh well, we'll let him speak for it later. But there he is. There's Lawrence. And then Hi, Lawrence. Hey Lawrence. Last, Hi Simon. And then last, hey, Austin. last but not least, we've got Angelo. Some of you might know Angelo. He's living up in Dongbei and makes YouTube videos quite regularly. So there he is. What's up, everybody? All right. <laughs> cool. Hey, Angelo. Hey. All right. Good. So everyone is in. All right. We got a comment from SSK. They're saying hello. So uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna hand it over to Simon, and we'll get we'll get going. Thanks everyone for joining and thanks Austin for helping us with some of the technical stuff. Um, so uh, in this uh, live stream, we're talking about uh, Chinese life in China and how it's different for foreigners who speak Chinese and can uh, connect to China in a, in a deeper sense. Um, uh, and also about learning Chinese and the whole dynamics about what Chinese language brings to life in China. Okay. So uh, just, uh, to give you an uh, uh, idea of some of the topics we're going to cover, we're going to talk about uh, learning Chinese. Is it difficult? Is it easy? Um, how does it help you? Uh, and uh, how, what are some downsides of uh, speaking Chinese? Um, and then also some cool stories that you've had uh, speaking Chinese or being in situations where you could, you're speaking Chinese, but other people might not know you're speaking Chinese. Um, and, uh, and then perhaps at the end, we do a few things on uh, some cool Chinese uh, phrases that we've learned um, that also let us know a deeper understanding of the Chinese culture. Okay. Um, uh, so first, I also want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a Chinese YouTuber based in Nanjing, and I have been in China since uh, on and off since 2001. And I Whoa. studied at Nanjing University uh, full time for two years. Uh, got a little background there, and I also study a little bit of Chinese at BU and at uh, Leeds University. Um, but uh, we can get into it uh, uh, about it. Um, and uh, I also enjoy China. I met my wife here. I have two kids, bought a little house, you know, the whole, you know, picket fence thing. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. And Angelo, you should have worn that Enjoy China shirt. I, I got really like Coca Cola. <laughs> oh, you've, got the, you've got the Coke. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh what happened? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I clicked the wrong button. Okay. Simon, okay. 2001. Wow. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm an oldie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's, I remember when China entered the WTO. That's how crazy it is. Anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, you get different stories and 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 different experiences. So, but that's what this is all about. You know, sharing and having uh, our experiences. Let's uh, introduce e e each other. Angelo, do you want to go next? Introduce yourself and your channel. Yes, yeah, sure. Hey guys, my name is Angelo. My Chinese nickname is Da An. I live in, well, first, I'm from the US, the state of Tennessee. I uh, moved to China in 2014. I live in the northeastern part of China. It's called Dongbei in Chinese. I'm like right next to North Korea, specifically the province of Liaoning. And yes, I've been in China for six years and I speak Chinese. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Okay. How about Lawrence? Why don't you go next? Um, sure. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Lawrence. I'm from America, and I've been living here in uh, Chengdu, China for the last 
five years. I've been studying Chinese actively for about three, three and a half years now, and I absolutely love it, and I love Chengdu. Yeah, you gotta love Chengdu, man. Chengdu is the best. It, it really is. is. <laughs> great, it's food, really chill great place. Yeah. It's amazing. I love Chengdu. It is mm. nice. Yeah. And then uh, finally, Austin, you're, you're neighbors with uh, Lawrence, right? Aren't you in Chongqing? Uh, no, I'm actually in Chengdu as well. Although I've oh. never actually met Lawrence. I've seen Lawrence in various group chats for years now. But, um, you know, I, you know <laughs> That's so yeah, China. The, yeah. the only thing I knew about Lawrence for a long time was Lawrence is, is not a dickhead, which was like... <laughs> <laughs> his, uh, which was okay. like, uh, which was, uh, uh, it was like one of his WeChat group aliases. That was the only thing that I knew for a while. But anyway, right. so I, I, I moved to uh, China in uh, 2011, um, and I was originally in Lanzhou in Gansu province, and then I moved to Tianjin, and then I came to Chengdu, and oh, uh, I teach at uh, Sichuan University. I'm one of China's goodest English teachers. Goodest. <laughs> goodest. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. So um, uh, let's get into our first uh, topic about um, also a little bit of background on uh, Chinese and how you learn Chinese. And um, I, I, I talked about how I... I Actually, when I first started, I was an English teacher for the first three years, and I was taking tutoring classes. Um, uh, but then at a certain point, I found that I was forgetting lots of words because I didn't know how to write them. And, uh, and also, yeah. I was just getting frustrated. <laughs> it, Chinese is hard. Chinese is really hard. So then I, I, yeah. I started studying at Nanjing University full time and then teaching English in the evenings to pay for uh, the tuition. Uh, which was rough because Chinese really takes a lot of time and and focus, um, and then uh, and then I went to Leeds University for a master's degree. With a, a part of that was a Chinese Chinese and business, which was kind of fun. Uh, and then came back and worked in a translation company that also improved my my Chinese level. Uh, but after that, then I had a job where I was really just using English all the time, and so my Chinese level may not have been as good as when I was working in the translation company. How about other people? Uh, 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 I want to I want to address a comment because I think this is a great place to start. Um, so we have a comment from someone named Green Eyes in China, and so I'll put it right here. Okay, Okay, so it says I think it's best to say Mandarin because the rest of the comment says because really, like, what is Chinese? Chinese, China has, you know, hundreds of types of languages, hundreds of, you know, dialects. So I think that's yeah. a really important point to bring up that like Chinese doesn't exist. Like it's a family of languages rather than a language, yeah. um, which was also said um, by this person. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Dialect. There's like a whole debate about what's a dialect versus what's a language. So like this um, yeah. the person who just commented says, actually it's not languages, it's dialects, which it's really yeah. interesting. So you take a language like, um, or a dialect, depending how you look at it, like Cantonese. I'm trying to learn some Cantonese now. It is mutually mm -hmm. indistinguishable from Mandarin. Um, so it has a different writing system. Is it a language? Is it a dialect? It's a good question. And a lot of linguists have this debate. But yeah, there's yeah. a lot of different dialects and maybe languages, depending how you look at it. Yeah, yeah and it's it's really cool. It's it's really cool and really frustrating as a foreigner dealing with dialects. You know, because mm. uh, you think you you think you got your Chinese down. You think you got it, and then you you travel somewhere, and then you don't understand. A goddamn word people are saying. <laughs> like Sichuan, <Sussuan>, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, sorry to derail the topic. It was um, about how we. But sort of, but, how but we also learned. that the, the good thing that the Chinese people who live in China, you should also be clear, they will know um, the Putonghua, the uh, Guoyu, the main language that they study in school and study in in university, and then they will know their dialects. It's only sometimes you meet some old people who haven't gone to high school and college that will have uh, you know only the local dialect and then very basic writing you know so mm. sometimes when i speak with my mother-in-law she she reverts to the nanjing hua uh, which i'm lucky right. nanjing hua nanjing dialect is very close to the mainland dialect so it's very easy to to understand mm. each other they just mix up the n's and the l's all the time but nothing big mm. <laughs> um, okay. so so, so when we, people, so when we talk about chinese generally uh uh, we're talking about the Putonghua, you know, uh, because everybody has that common language. And then in addition to that, they'll have the dialects of where they live, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the whole thing. It's, it's something that definitely I think should be addressed kind of upfront is that Chinese is a, it, it's, it's not a great term because there is, a, there are all these debates, but yeah, let's, let's get back into how we learned Mandarin. Okay, let's do Mandarin. Or I know Angelo doesn't speak a load of Mandarin, but like how we, <laughs> how we, um, how we learned. Uh, let's say our language. <laughs> so who? Uh, let's start with Angelo then. Okay, so uh, I have a very, very, very heavy northeastern accent when I speak uh, Mandarin, <laughs> or I'd call it northeastern mm -hmm. Mandarin. And if you watch any of my videos, it's very. Uh, evident but how i learned i uh how i learned this here and i have never ever 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 had a formal chinese class i guess that is why i speak uh i have more of a dialect when i speak and not really standard mandarin but it is said by most chinese people and they do agree that the northeastern uh dialect is closest to uh is very close to standard mandarin there is a lot of mm -hmm. r there is a lot of this and that but i didn't have any formal classes not one in, in the entire six years I studied on my own through a variety of excellent programs. And if you've seen some of my videos, I just love to go out and talk to Chinese people. In my opinion, speaking Chinese to the Chinese people is probably the best part about uh, living in China. It's just so fun. It's a big boost to your ego and uh, you just, it, it feels great. So over the mm -hmm. six years, just talking, using self-study programs. And that's uh, basically it and immersing myself in like a, a and shows and I watch a lot of uh, videos on Billy Billy, the Chinese version of YouTube. <laughs> and uh, that's how I learned, just getting out there and uh, self, self, self study programs. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's throw it over to Lawrence. Okay, so, well, I've been here for about five years now. And, you know, my first year here, I wasn't planning on learning the language at all. I figured I would just come for one year, enjoy it, and then go back to America, right? But, um, I ended up staying around for a second year. And by my second year here, I was like, okay, I'm still struggling with like basic things that a toddler could do, you know, like order food at a restaurant, stuff like that. Mm. <laughs> and um, it was kind of embarrassing actually that I couldn't do some very basic tasks. I need someone to hold my hand and take me with them. And I said, you know what, I'm an adult. I'm gonna buckle down and do this. You know, I'm not the only person to uh, learn a foreign language as an adult. And so, I have been uh, basically self-taught. I do have a private teacher and she talks to me on WeChat and we just do WeChat video calls and I love it. It's fantastic. In addition to that, I just like um, he was saying, I watch a lot of Billy Billy. I um, listen to Chinese music. I read Chinese books. I try to immerse my whole entire ecosystem here in Chinese, you know, Chinese friends, Chinese media, Chinese everything. So I just immerse myself into it. All right, all right. And uh, I guess it kind of goes to me now. Um, so I originally came to China uh, as a student. Um, I had an opportunity to study abroad at a university in Gansu, and uh, I was their first ever foreign student, uh, foreign exchange student, and I was the only foreign exchange student. So like they created the entire like learn Chinese department for me. So I was in like one-on-one -on -one classes uh, for like six months. And I learned probably, you know, the equivalent of two or three years of Chinese back home in like six months. 
uh, and that was sort of the foundation of everything. Uh, and then after that semester, um, like I graduated and then just kind of self-taught, you know, kind of like you guys. And um, yeah, social media. Social media is a huge help when it comes to learning Chinese. That was how I learned a lot of my reading and like, you know, the slang and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, now I don't, I don't learn too much. Like uh, I don't sit down and read a lot of books or anything like that, but I go out and I talk to people and I'm married to a, a Chinese lady. So, um, you know, I, I talk with the in-laws and things like that. So uh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. You know, the, the in-laws is where you know you, you got to a certain level because they also have <laughs> accents and it's also like confusing, right, Angelo? You also have these issues. <laughs> uh, yeah, it takes a while to get used to understanding when older people speak. That's that's a, one of the challenges. When you understand still, older people, your Chinese yeah. is good. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I have yeah. very few problems understanding most of my in-laws, but my mother-in-law, <clears throat> I don't understand... 80% of what she says. Oh, gosh. She's got a very weird cadence and she speaks very quickly and she's from deep Sichuan. It's not your wow. normal Sichuanese accent. It's kind of crazy. That's but, the same as my, yeah. my father-in-law is exactly the same. He doesn't have a standard like Sichuan accent. He has like the really, really, you know, deep one. And so what people will do is they will, in the family, they will translate it into Mandarin for me. So I'll go from like Sichuan Hua to Mandarin, and then I'll be like, okay, and I'll speak back in Mandarin, and they'll yeah, translate. You. He'll understand. He, they won't need to translate back into Sichuan Hua because they can mm -hmm. under, still understand Mandarin. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things I, I think sometimes uh, when people come, they they ask me like. I, how long does it take to, to learn Chinese and what's the different levels of Chinese? And uh, I like, I feel like there's like three kind of levels. There's like uh, basic conversation I call taxi bar level uh, Chinese. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> as you said, like if you order stuff in a restaurant, you order uh, a taxi, tell them which way. Oh, you're going the wrong way. Take a left, take a right. You know, because sometimes you need to do that. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, uh, competent Chinese is the other one where you can like do basic things, you know, have a conversation about something other than food. Um, and then the Dashan level of Chinese where like, <laughs> you could go on a TV show and perform um, uh, like uh, Shangshan, you know, the, the two person comedy routines and things like that, where they just talking in puns and uh, influ uh, talking very quickly and messing oh, with oh. each other, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? Um, I think there's a difference between fluency versus mastery. Uh, these two words, just like language and dialect, kind of get thrown around a lot. Um, people say, how long does it take to be fluent? Well, when you were a three-year-old in your native language, you were by definition fluent, right? You know, I was a fluent uh, three-year-old, you know, baby, a toddler in America for English, right? So mastery is usually something that experts will say takes about 10,000 hours to achieve. Um, there's a debate on that too, but um, there's a difference between fluency and mastery. I think that's you know important to bring up. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think, so like, how about, uh, how long did it, did it take you guys uh, to go, to get into that zone where you kind of can go out and do basic daily life stuff and feel comfortable, like without being shy, without kind of stumbling over your words, just to go out and say, you know, just order like some food, like that level one, how long did it take you to get there? About a year. Yeah, About a I year? think like six months to a year, you know, eight months or so at least. Um. I would say six months. <laughs> I would say yeah. six, six months. months. Yeah, Maybe I, I'm I, I agree. Yeah. So um, here, I, we're talking yeah. like the basic stuff. Like you don't actually know all the characters. You just know, you know, like uh, boy bathroom, girl bathroom, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, like what is spicy, what's not spicy, you know, some, th mm -hmm. certain things where you get in trouble if you don't know it. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I think six months, uh, maybe eight months, uh, if you if you work at it. This is with a tutor with with being intensive, right? You know, not just mm -hmm. osmosis because Chinese is not 
it's not going to be like Spanish or something where you watch enough TV, yeah. you pick up half of the words, you know, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. just won't happen. I'm telling you, it won't happen. Totally. It's, I think you said it perfectly. It's not like an English speaker learning Spanish or French. It's a totally different ballpark. You have tones, you have characters, unfamiliar concepts. And um, SSSK asked if it's difficult to learn Chinese from America. I think it's hard for any native English speaker. Uh, would you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a um, whole different switch in your brain you've got a really you've got a really flip a switch you like we could probably get into this later but you do have a certain like uh like a separate personality like a chinese personality <laughs> the chinese brain and a chinese logic and it takes a long time to figure that out and especially figuring out the tones like the way that my throat feels when i speak chinese is totally different the way that i adjust things in my throat's totally like it takes it takes a while to to figure that out and if you're not in china constantly practicing it's it's pretty tough but i think it's kind of like i think it's like a bucket of water right when you first get a few drops of water in your bucket you know the bucket being your mind you're like oh my god i can speak a few words i can you know order food i can ask where the bathroom is and you feel so excited and then mm -hmm. add more drops into this bucket and you're like you know, I could drink out of this bucket. I can use this bucket to make friends, do some simple tasks. Then you keep adding these drops. I mean, the drops could be an hour of study. It could be a day of study, you know. And then after a while, you don't even notice it's accumulating, but it is accumulating. And then yeah. the beautiful thing is you get like halfway through this bucket filled with water and you get this like, boom, this breakthrough where all of a sudden you're like, wow. I'm actually able to really communicate in Chinese and do everything in Chinese. And it's a wonderful feeling. You get further and further along in this bucket and the water adds up. You can use that water to drink. You can use that water to, you know, farm, you know, just a little bit of a metaphor for how you can use that knowledge. So back to that uh, question that person asked about, uh, can you learn a Chinese in the U S I believe that you can, and here's why. So um, when I was in the U.S., I learned Spanish, and I learned it very well. That's because I was with, I, I worked around a Spanish community. I was in it, I was engaged in it, along with my active study, and I was around them all the time. It felt, it felt almost like, and I live in the South, and there's a lot of Mexican people. It felt like I was <laughs> yeah. in Mexico. I mean, there, it was that was all I was hearing was Spanish. They were making food and eating this. And I wanted to learn. I was so uh, motivated to learn because they were all around me speaking and, and I, I immersed myself into it. And in the U.S., uh, especially in like, for example, New York City, if you like look at some videos on YouTube, especially Salma's and you see him in those communities, it looks like you're in China. It looks just like you're somewhere in China. There are Chinese people everywhere. You see Chinese language. I believe if you were like him and you were in that community, all the time, constantly. You could probably learn Chinese in America in like a just a in the community. It depends about depends on the community. <laughs> I like this. One. I'm in China. I like this one. I, I, so true. So true. I, I want to say, you know, it was more on the mastery. If once you get to the you know six months taxi level uh, Chinese, then the jump to the next one, I feel is takes a long time. I had a, a quote someone told me when I was studying. It's a uh, Studying Chinese is like a five-year lesson in patience. At the end of five years, you still don't know Chinese, but you do know patience, you know. Because <laughs> yeah, it can take a while. <laughs> and yeah. I, I've also yeah. found people humbling. get jaded about China because they get so frustrated learning Chinese that well, if you are here, you so much you can do um, that you don't have to have the Chinese language for. But it does open doors. It does make it so very interesting if you put the time in and, and get to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, All right. Uh, okay. okay, so, um, oh, uh, Lawrence, did you also say, uh, want to talk about uh, if Chinese is difficult or did, did you handle that? Oh yeah, I was trying to use my water bucket analogy um, for oh, how much time oh. you want to spend. Um, as yeah, that was for, good. Um, yeah, thanks. I, it wasn't from mine. I actually got it from somebody else. <laughs> but um, I think it all depends on how you allocate your time, right? So everybody here, it doesn't matter, everyone, you know, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, everybody has the same amount of time in their life. You know, Elon Musk can run multiple companies. Um, it all depends how you use your time, right? So if you put yourself in a Chinese environment, 
well, what does that mean? It means, you know, who you're speaking with, you know, what you're doing uh, for entertainment, what you're reading, et cetera, how you spend your time. If you can squeeze out your time to be most efficient for a Chinese environment, you can really go uh, relatively quickly from that first, you know, like, like you said, Simon, I believe the taxi cab level to, you know, getting to that deeper, you know, that deeper understanding. It's all about how you alloc allocate your time, I believe, regardless of where you live. Yes. Yeah. And like, I, I feel so grateful for how I, for my experience learning Chinese, because it just put me through boot camp, like these one on one classes for college credit. Uh, so like I couldn't mess around. I could not study because I knew that I had to. So I studied. I would wake up at 6 a.m. every day. I would study until class at 8, you know, be in class until like 4 o'clock and then study from 4 o'clock until about midnight. And I would so I was like studying 6 a.m. to midnight, six days a week. And I did wow. that for about I did that for about four months. Wow. And then I figured out little shortcuts like little hacks and like the ways that I could personally study, like my learning styles. And like, I wish I still had the book. It's in my wife's hometown, but like you can see my progress that I've annotated the book. Like I would write the pinyin above this. And then I started writing the little tone markers and you can see it kind of gradually go away to where I could like read it. Cause my teachers just gave me a book for China. It was like a, like a HSK, like, 4.5 or HSK 5 level. Wow, that's kind of hard to start. That's really hard to start. All in Chinese. All in Chinese. Like no opinion, no nothing. Wow. And they just said, here, read that. We're doing chapter one on Monday and it's Friday. Like, Mother. Okay. All right. <laughs> like, so just like the time, like Lauren said, all of that is to like totally agree with what Lauren said. It's all about your time. 100%. Yeah, I just want to add on to what Austin was saying. I totally agree with him. Um, and I actually had this problem when I first started learning Chinese. And I was like, okay, where do I go? Do I learn the first you know, few hundred characters? Do I uh, learn pinyin first? Like, how do I start? What do I do? Where's the blueprint, right? And I couldn't figure it out. I went on Reddit. I went on you know, different you know, websites, different forums. I couldn't find the answer. There was no like one book that would tell me, okay, Lawrence, this is what you need to do. Do this, this, and this, you know, and this type of uh, method. So actually, uh, just recently, I wrote uh, a book, Mastering Mandarin, which basically gives what I wish I had when I was first learning Chinese. It gives you this roadmap to like, it's not going to teach you the language per se. It's going to teach you how to teach yourself the language, how you need to study like Austin did. You know, I did the same stuff, you know, 12 hour study sessions and stuff like that. And um, it's something that I wish I had when I was just starting out or even in like the intermediate beginner intermediate phase. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Master yeah, no problem, no problem. Thanks yeah. for the plug. I think I also want to people. extend on Lawrence because uh, having really good materials yeah. and having a good way of studying is also very important. Uh, I, before I came to China in 2001, I had uh, one semester of uh, Chinese and then I was spending all my time studying Chinese for that one class that I didn't need to graduate. So I, I dropped it, which was, which was good. So I had some sanity in my last semester. Um, but that Chinese book was published in the 1980s. So they had all this communist slang that was crazy. It was this green uh, Chinese practical reader. Um, and uh, they'd have things like, Comrade Bianca, let's go to the communal dining hall and have some meals <laughs> together. It's like, you yeah. humble me with your praise, oh wise one. Oh, you humble me, no you. And so I came here. And not only do people just laugh when I say comrade all the time, I was like, comrade, hello, comrade, hello. You know, they were just like, who are you? You know, nobody says comrade. And, uh, 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 and then later, because I was in Suzhou, which is next to Shanghai and it's a bit more open, that Tongzhi also means gay guy. 
So then sometimes when I talk to people, people would give me an extra big smile. They'd be like, uh-huh, what's up? And then later someone told me, and I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? <laughs> so having good books and uh, up-to-date books is very important. Um, and then mm. on the style, I think, Austin, that's really impressive that you did that um, intensive stuff. But I found that when I went back and I learned the radicals of characters, so yeah. uh, when you see a character, uh, there's different ways of memorizing it. You can memorize it as, you know, 10 slashes, or you can memorize it as three parts of the word. Like you have the, the character um, Hao, uh, which is with the uh, Nuzipong and Z. So the woman and child, and that's good, you know. And so that family is the epitome of goodness in China. So that's why Hao is made up of woman and child. If you have a woman in your life and a child in your life, Everything's You're good. good. <laughs> right. Is that is that your favorite word? Uh, is that yeah, your favorite I like word? I like this comment. Favorite Chinese word. Um, Ooh. Or we, we can say phrase as well. Like that's that's a good one. No, uh, I actually yeah. have one that came to mind. Okay, go ahead, Angela. And, and I'm sure it's it, it's it's pronounced differently from where you guys live, but uh, it's play. So war, and I use that. Uh, I use that a lot in China, and it's a it's a very uh, versatile word because the way you use it, you can it can mean many things, not just play. But uh, here in the Northeast, it's used a lot to mean many things, and I like the way it sounds with the R sound. We say it up here. We say war, war. So I like that word, war, play. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm just I'm writing it out. Yeah, uh, I believe you guys say yeah. Wan, right in Sichuan. They add the end. Yeah, well, they don't. I, the I say. I one. add the R. It just sounds better. Oh, yeah, right the R. R. I, <laughs> I like add the way it sounds. R. It sounds better, yeah. I hate the R sound. I don't add R. R. Anything. I absolutely hate <laughs> the the R. Yeah, yeah, I don't do that. I like it a little bit. Depends on the word. I hate when they sure. overdo it. When they overdo it, it drives me crazy. It's right, extremely right, overdone right. here in the Northeast. Everything ends with R. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a basic thing. Like, don't you R, don't you R. Yeah. So yeah. here, if I can, uh, if I can uh, describe it in the best way possible, if uh, the Chinese here, if you take a Chinese person and fill his mouth with marbles and let him speak, that's what it sounds like <laughs> here in the Northeast. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, people from Beijing are the worst. Yeah, I can't, I can't stand the Beijing accent because it's that's the perfect analogy. It's like you filled someone's mouth with marbles. It's, I love Beijing. No it's like a pirate. Everybody. It's not that bad. It's like a pirate. It's war, war, war. <laughs> Let's go. War, war. <laughs> no, not in. Okay, what, all right. What's your favorite? What's your favorite word? I'm so, still thinking. All right. I'll, so I'll Audrey, I. I oh. I I thought of some uh, like phrases. If you want me to share my screen, uh, I can. Uh, uh, talk okay. about some of the my fun, funny things. Um, oh, it's yeah, not what, that one. Yeah, you're gonna have to leave the window. Uh, you're gonna have to just make that document full screen. You're gonna have to zoom in on it. Okay, let's try. So you you won't be able to see yourself, but just trust oh. that you're still. Okay. Yeah, just make that full screen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, okay. Do, 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 do. Okay. So, can you see this? Yes. Uh, okay. So, mostly, yeah, mostly. A little bit. Make it full screen. <laughs> hit, hit, hit F five. F five. Um. Uh. See this one? Do you see this here? My body is not my own, that one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can see it, yeah. It's a bit small, but yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, anyway, Shin Bu Yo Ji. So, Shin Ti Bu Yo Ji. So, this one means um, when you work for like an on-call job or you're not sure if you'll be called in for a class or doing something else, uh, then you can say this one. It means like, I'm not in control of my time. I can't promise now that I'll be able to do go out to lunch with you or do something else because I can't my boss might call me at any 
any time uh, to do something. Uh, so this one is is quite common because a lot of people, ha even if they're not like medical people, they're on call and they have this type of situation where you know if the boss calls and you have to jump, you have to jump. That's that's just it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, and then there's also funny ones like uh, in China when they have like chicken soup, uh, they have the uh, they put the chick the whole chicken in the soup. And it's uh, lo tang ji, yeah. you know. So yeah. uh, I was like, I'm wet like a chicken in a soup. <laughs> I just find it really funny. Yeah. And they use it all the time, you know. Um, and then uh, uh, no seeing, no leaving. You know, it's like, I'll wait for you here until you arrive. I will put you in Busan, something like that. Yeah. And uh, the last one, sha ji ge ho kan. So kill the chickens for the... Uh, to scare the monkeys or for the monkeys to see it so then they won't act up. You know, this is also very common that uh, you make okay. an example sometimes, you know, in the classroom, if the, the kid's naughty, you know, punish the first person really strict, harshly, then everyone else will be afraid of you. <laughs> so, That's <so> right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I like to kill the, I like to kill the chicken to scare the monkeys. That one's nice. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think my favorite at the moment, like, you know, it, it changes a lot, but my favorite at the moment is it's, I, it's very, very Sichuan, but I think it might apply to other places. It's just Ma Shang. Ma Shang, Ma Shang, Ma Shang. Soon, soon. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's just like, I, I mentioned this in that collab that, uh, me and Angelo and a few others did. Um, it's just like, cause it literally means like on the horse, right? Um, yeah. So it means like it should be done quickly or something's gonna happen very soon. But they, they use it in a way that it's like, just like, just hold on a minute. Like it doesn't matter, <laughs> just, just calm down. Like, you know, uh, if we are a woman in Thai, I may shang up. Like, I'm a shang, my shang. Like, waiter. I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm ready. Yeah. We, we, we actually, uh, we have our own word for that here in the Northeast. I mean, you can say ma shang, but uh, there's an actual uh, dialectal uh, word here, a Dongbei word for that. It's called uh, ma liu. He's in the building. Ma liu. Ma liu. <laughs> Mario. Okay. Huh. <laughs> yeah, that's a new one. Yep. My favorite word is actually a Chongyu, and it's uh, Zheng Guai Bu Guai. And I, like I, I love it. Uh, Zheng Guai Bu Guai. Um, they're all fourth tone, which is really interesting. And also, it has like different oh, meanings. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. And it's like, it's like if you see something very strange, it could be like a very peculiar thing you see outside or whatever. You, yeah. You're just like, all right, don't pay any attention to that, whatever, you know, it is what it is. Okay, don't worry about it. But it can also mean something like you're so numb and so used to it, kind of like if you're in like New York City, right? And you see some weird stuff going on. So you could just be like, you know, it's just like, it doesn't faze me anymore. I'm so numb to it. It's whatever, you know? So it has like a dual meaning. And I think it's really apt and awesome for an expat living here in China. I like that phrase. You know what, Austin? Uh, you made a video like a long time ago. I want to say like seven years ago. And I learned that phrase from a website you shared on one of your YouTube channels, the Pop Up Chinese. Oh, right, right, right. You shared yeah, that yeah. a long time ago. I can't remember how long that ago that was, but that's where oh, I learned yeah, that phrase yeah, from Pop Up Chinese. That's an excellent resource, by the way. Yeah, that that's from the Lanzhou days. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's wow. really old video. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> so Lawrence, yeah. I noticed when you uh, speak Chinese, you speak really fast. <laughs> I always I always speak fast, no matter which language I'm speaking in. <laughs> oh, I here can say it's slower. So it's, it's a little bit slower. That's, that's here in like yeah. the Northeast, we speak, or I speak very fast. So if I said it, it'd be like, uh, you're like, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm a bit, <laughs> we speak caffeine. really slow here. I had too much coffee <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah. Your way you say it sounds more natural. I'm just trying to emphasize the tones. You know, like as foreigners, a lot right. of foreigners have like tone problems. So when I'm trying to teach it to a foreigner or something, I go heavy on those tones. Oh, yeah. Kind of like habit. But if you're just saying it to like a Chinese person, of course, you know. 
毕竟真怪不怪了。You know, just really, you don't gotta go so crazy, but、uh, try to emphasize the tones for、uh, the audience. Yeah, also on tones, like Chinese people are forgiving. If you don't like completely get all the tones, they, they understand the context and other stuff. You can get along really well. And there's quite a few places where people have bad tones. You know, Nanjing. Some some of the older people and other people don't have great tones, but people just gets along. Like, oh, well, I understand. You know, or oh, what's up? You know.、Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're learning it. Yes, it's important to learn the tones, but、um, being one hundred percent is not completely necessary. Just to get be competent and to get things done, and for people to understand you, you know, things like that.、Mm-hmm. So, no, I I think it's a it's about time we're kind of falling down a rabbit hole. We can, oh yeah, okay. You know, get back to it.、So. Uh, who wants to start first with this one?、Um. So. I can I can say something very quickly.、Um, okay. So some、uh, some jobs. I mean, you can come over and do a lot of different jobs without knowing any Chinese. But、um, specifically, if you take the HSK exam, which is the Chinese proficiency exam, and you put that on your resume,、um, it sort of it it proves that language won't be a barrier. So it will kind of help you. Uh, when you're working in jobs like、uh, tourism, if you're working in jobs spe- like even like translating or interpreting, or if you're doing game design or web design, and you have to work with Chinese coworkers, taking the HSK,、uh, that proficiency exam will really help you.、Um, and as a as a vlogger,、um, I've I've gone on various like tourism campaigns, and they've asked me to speak with local people. Um, while they film it, and it becomes part of their campaign, and so that's helped me、um, with like making videos. And I guess it's professional because they paid me for it, and been on TV and things like that. So it can definitely help you professionally. So, yeah. So my experience on this, I am a,、uh, I am an English teacher here in China, and you're probably thinking, I did see a comment.、Um, Oh, Lawrence, did you want to say something? You're up on the screen. No, it's on you. I'm, I'm listening. It's on Lawrence now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I was like, oh, is it Lawrence? I thought it was. I thought it was Lawrence talking because my internet's、oh, well, not we, so good. We sound alike. I, the,、uh, <laughs> I can't see the、uh, mouth moving so well. Maybe I should switch to my really in a Southern Tennessee accent. All right, everybody, it's my turn. You ready? It's not Lawrence's turn. Okay. Oh, yeehaw! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what I was saying,、uh, yeah, I'm an English teacher in China, and I saw a comment just earlier about um,、uh, some、yeah. guy said I think it was a SSK or something.、Um, oh, I can't learn Chinese because I speak English every day, and I'm an English teacher. Well, I am an English teacher in China, and、uh, because I can speak Chinese、uh, well, I、uh, so professionally, back to professional. So I have a good relationship、mm-hmm. with my boss, who is、uh, the owner of the schools here, and is obviously Chinese.、Uh, she's female. And I have a good relationship with her, and I believe it is because、uh, I speak Chinese. Her English is amazing, but when you get to a certain level of Chinese, where it's just very good, the Chinese people will speak to you in Chinese. They will. And、uh, I have a good relationship with her, and I feel like、um, it has helped a lot professionally because I can,、um, I, su- I can suggest things, I can get things done quicker. This can happen, that can happen, and I just feel like. The uh, the uh, relationship between me and her is very good. Also with my、uh, coworkers who are uh, Chinese, uh, are, are Chinese. They're like the assistant teacher, but they also all talk to me in Chinese. And during lunchtime or any scenario, I go and sit down with them. We talk, and it just makes、uh, the atmosphere in my job so much better when we can when we can talk like that. When when I can have that、um, because they do speak English very well, obviously, but. They're Chinese and they like to speak their native language, and that I feel like that has helped me professionally to enjoy my job more because I speak Chinese with them, and、um, and it says here in general too how to speaking help、uh, definitely helps in everyday life. I mean, you can be very dependent. You don't have to. You can very be very independent. You don't have to depend on other people. And as an American, I don't like to feel like I owe somebody something. I hate that feeling. So. If someone wants to borrow money from me, like if it's not a lot, I'll be like, "Here, just take it. You don't owe me anything. I'm your friend. I'll help you out." So I like to be independent. I don't want to de- depend on anybody because I have an ego. I'll just say it: I have an ego, and I don't want to like 
damage it and, and it <laughs> you know what i'm trying to say yeah. so i just love yeah. the independence and so that's how it helps me uh feels like i feel like it helps me in like general life i can go and do things on my own and not bother other people or feel like i owe them something i also have an ego <laughs> <laughs> okay so um recently i was just paid uh to do like an advertisement for a summer camp and i was I was speaking in Chinese to the parents. So, I mean, that was an example of using Chinese professionally. I've given speeches uh, in Chinese. I get to hold a piece of paper, so it's much easier. Um, but uh, yeah, there's plenty of opportunities. If you're a foreigner and you can speak some decent Chinese, there's a, the sky's the limit for you. You can go on TV shows. I was in a TV show about a month and a half ago on Chengdu, on Chengdu Plus, yeah. And I was watching myself on TV, which, I mean, it would never happen if I was just, you know, in America speaking English, right? So there are so <laughs> yeah, many, right. it's amazing. <laughs> and I've seen Austin, you know, do amazing stuff, uh, speaking Chinese really well. Um, so there is a lot of opportunities for you. The one thing, actually, I have a different situation than what you said, because a lot of Chinese people, when they speak, they want to practice their English, right? So even though they know you can speak Chinese, they still want to have, like, time for them to practice their English. So it's kind of like a constant battle, like at least here in Chengdu. I don't know if that's the same for uh, other people, but it's like a back and forth of like, you know, which language to take. Yeah, I want to ask you, Lawrence. So do you ever get into those, or any of you guys, do you ever get into those uh, language battles where you're with a Chinese person, probably most likely a stranger, you're speaking Chinese at them full force, but they just keep speaking English to you. Does anybody ever just give up and revert to either Chinese or English? Like, do you guys give up and go to English? Or do they give <laughs> I don't up give up. Chinese? I, I don't give up either. I, I, make, yeah, I, I always make, win. <laughs> big egos. I make one exception. Like, if their okay. English is, like, 100% amazing, like, native speaking English. If they're, like, a native English speaker, totally perfect. Okay, I'll concede. If they're, like, just leaps and bounds ahead of me, all right, fine. You win. You win. You know, we'll do English. But the majority of the time, I will have this like, yeah, boy, just like this kind of match. Mm -hmm. And I will do whatever I can to revert it back to Chinese. If that means speaking very quickly in English, so be it. You know, whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I, my first year was in China was in Suzhou. And then I visited Shanghai and I visited Nanjing. And Shanghai was crazy because uh, also it was WTO time, 2001, 2002. And uh, at that time, like everybody wanted to practice English. And it doesn't matter how good your Chinese was. They would be like, let's go back to English. And they'd have bad English, really bad English. But they were like, oh, we have to speak this because we're in WTO and we have to like get better and get better and better. But And now like Shanghai is very... Uh, many places are bilingual and like uh, there's a large percentage, maybe like 30, 40 percent have uh, very good English skills. And so um, mm -hmm. if you want to study Chinese and go outside of your campus and speak Chinese, I would say don't go to Shanghai. You know, <laughs> even Beijing was better. I went to Beijing and people yeah. were like, oh, you, you speak Chinese. That's funny. OK, let's speak Chinese or something, you know, um, and it would be more polite about it, even if they could speak English as well. Um, but I feel that was. Right. That was key. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, there are different cities. Like I think if you want to come to China to have a language experience, then there are definitely better places to go. Like, so like for example, Shanghai would be an awful place to go because everyone speaks English or going to somewhere like Wenzhou would be a horrible place to go to learn Mandarin because their dialect is completely different. Or like I would say, you need to go to a third tier city, somewhere like way off the beaten path, like, like Angelo's in Tungshan. <laughs> yeah, and I moved to Lanzhou, and like out, like even the head of the English department like didn't speak English, and like like nobody outside the campus that I was at spoke English, and you know I'm sure like basically no one in Fushun speaks English. So you need to if you want to have a language experience in China, you need to be pretty careful in your choices yeah hey uh on i have some other photograph things i could try and share i'm doing it with a uh 
uh, just a viewer. So is that better? Okay. So this oh, was a better. poster yeah. on my door today. Uh, uh, and sometimes you get these things, and this one's about you know COVID, you know. So it's uh, oh yeah. yeah so yeah. when uh, check the temperature, show your coats, uh, uh, Jin Ma, and then go Dai Kojao, wear a face mask, Tong Feng, have an aerated area, wash your hands, and Ge uh, Juli, uh, practice social distancing. You know, so if you speak Chinese and they they put this up, you know, then then that helps. Um, and then the second one. Uh, also, uh, there's oh, there was something else. Did, 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 did. Is it gonna work? I don't know. This one here. Uh, so in Nanjing, they also put up these cool murals um, with different art and stuff like that. And this one's about the morality of freedom and equality. Zio Pingden, you know, free, uh, freedom yeah, and yeah. equality and stuff like that. And it's really cool if you go uh, walking and and see see stuff, and you can. Get like little captions and stuff like that. Um, there's also a yeah. um, modern art museum near my house, and it's re it's really it enhances your life because you get to um, experience some of what what things mean, and you can um, you can also use uh, WeChat and uh, and Google Translate to take a picture and translate it. So you don't have to have great Chinese, but it does help if it's just like a one-off thing, and you you see something. Oh, what does that say? And they're like, oh, that's that's what it means. Um, but yes, Ari Tolly, yo, Nanjing in the house. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, but go. Nanjing's a really uh, big university town. It's sort of like a Boston of uh, China. You know, got tons of universities. Sure, sure. So why that's important is in universities they all speak standard Mandarin. So it's really easy to understand what's going on, and lots of people have very highly educated, very standard. Uh, uh, Chinese Mandarin uh, speaking, so it's easy to live in that way. Um, and I really like yeah. Nanjing, lots of parks, and and it's it's an underrated second tier city. You know. <laughs> I was walking into a convenience store last year in Shanghai, and the elderly Chinese lady behind the counter said, "What are you looking for, honey?" Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. Whoa, I don't like this layout. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's yeah. so that English thing. Have you ever like uh, faked like you're from some other country and you can't speak English, so you can just like speak Chinese? Oh yeah, yeah. I did uh, Spanish. Yeah, I've done Spanish. I, I, I yeah. Well, I've yeah. done that too, and uh, one time it backfired on me because I said I was from Italy, and the dude whipped out some perfect Italian. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh <God."> yeah. <laughs> wow. Like, oh, <laughs> and I was just yeah. like. Uh, I got to go. <laughs> I, I had something similar. I yeah. had this uh, Chinese Canadian friend um, who grew up in Canada and uh, learned Yue uh, Yu spoken wise, but didn't know any Mandarin and uh, came over. But whenever we went to the restaurant, we'd sit down and the waiter would give him the, the menu and he'd be like, oh, no, actually give it back to Simon. Simon, you read it and, and, and you order something. And then the waiter would be like, what, what the heck is this? A foreigner who speaks Chinese. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and it's Chinese person or an Asian guy who doesn't speak Chinese. Oh my God, what's going on? So yeah, yeah. That, that same thing I, happened to me at a at a restaurant with my friend who speaks Cantonese. They kept giving her the you know the menu and like that she couldn't communicate with him, and so I kept doing it. And the waiter couldn't like understand. It was like cannot process, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a, I I don't. This doesn't exactly fit, but I just think it's a funny story. I was at the airport, I think, I can't remember exactly where, but I was at an airport it was somewhere in China and I, I went into the smoking room and um, it was my first time ever going into a smoking room, it was 2011. And I go in, a bunch of Chinese people and um, like I go up to the guy and like you can't bring a lighter into the airport. So I didn't know how to light my smoke. And I go up to the guy and said, well, can you need a Zahojima? Can I use your lighter? And he goes, Oh, well, okay, you don't need a, need a Dahojima. And he goes, Dude, I don't speak Chinese. I'm like, oh, oh. And I was like, well, What do you mean? He's like, I'm from San Francisco. I'm like, oh, Okay, all right. But he was a totally Chinese looking dude. He's like, My parents are both Chinese. I get it. Uh, so I'm like, oh, All right, I guess I'm speaking English at the airport from now on. So you, you guys, uh, 
you guys keep talking about Cantonese and stuff. In my experience, when I oh. went to Hong Kong, me and my girlfriend, my girlfriend is also from the Northeast China. When we went to Hong Kong, we used Mandarin just fine. I kid you not. We were speaking Mandarin and had no problems communicating in Hong Kong. They, Of course, they had an accent. And my girlfriend's like, you speak better than them, but we could still use Mandarin in Hong Kong. And it was a blast. So we didn't have to use Cantonese. Yeah, um, I I did have a problem with Mandarin in Hong Kong. Oh, really? Actually, like, when I was using because I remember they, just in one or two places, they were like those back alley like restaurants run by like super old dudes. And <laughs> like I went in there to order, like I remember one specifically where they're like the chef got mad at me uh, because he couldn't understand what I was saying. And I wanted to order curry dumplings. So like gali jiaozi, so like mm. that's perfect Mandarin, gali jiaozi. Mm. And he's like, I'm sorry, dude, sorry, dude. And like, I just like left. <laughs> like, Fair point, Austin. Yeah. I was in 7-Elevens, the hotel and big uh, tourist district. So yeah, that's, that's where I was reading my Mandarin at. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so maybe we just go to the downside. Awesome. Are there any downsides from uh, uh, speaking Mandarin, you know, or being bilingual that people lean on you too much or, or have other issues? Uh, Lawrence, what do you think? Uh, do you find some um, issues that come up when because people know you speak Chinese or have some uh, issues like that? Um, I don't know if there oh, are too hey, many downsides. Real quick, uh, Simon, I, I, I think a lot of people can hear you breathing into your mic, so yeah, just put oh. it. Put Sorry. it, uh, put it away excited. for a second. Yeah. Make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure. Some uh, downsides of being bilingual. I don't think there are really too many downsides. Um, sometimes when I'm trying to speak uh, in English, I will forget some of the words. Like the Chinese word will come to me <laughs> first when I'm yeah. speaking with, yeah. right? It happens to you too, right? So. Mafan. <laughs> <laughs> mafan. Um, yeah, it's pretty mafan. Um, so yeah. that would be, I guess, the downside. Uh, another downside would be the amount of time it takes to really, you know, get to a certain level that you want to get at. I wouldn't say it's a downside of being bilingual per se. It's just kind of like the eternal struggle of trying to get to mastery. And it's a long struggle. It's a big, you know, time. It's a big time. Uh, uh, I can't think of the word in English, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> so, yeah, forgetting words in English and... Um, yeah. The Maybe opportunity cost, you know, how much time cost, you spent yeah. doing this, you could go do an engineering degree and stuff like that. Because uh, You can learn Spanish, French, and German in the amount of time it takes just to learn, you know, Mandarin. So <laughs> I agree yeah. with that, because <laughs> I did, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. <well. laughs> no, so it's just French and Spanish, but still, like, uh, I, I agree that uh, it's Chinese is on a, on a different level, and it does take a lot longer than the Romance languages. Yeah. So, um... A downside of being bilingual, I think, is you can hear when other people are talking about you. Like, you know exactly what they think, because a lot of people, they just say, oh, it's, it's a white guy. He didn't speak Chinese. So they are going to, like, they're going to, like, look you up and down, and then they're going to, like, <laughs> eyes you up, and they're going to talk about every aspect of your appearance and what they think you're like as a person. And I remember the first time this happened to me where I could understand it. Um, I was on a bus in Lanjo, and uh, I remember these girls get on and they sit just behind me and then they start talking. Like, oh, look at that foreigner. And, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I see him. God, how ugly is that guy? Like, he's so <laughs> fat. Like, how? And I remember like hearing this phrase, like, Tadzimanamapanga. Like, <laughs> like, how can he be that fat? And I'm like, oh, geez, man. And then they just went through like all these different things. They're talking about my beard and my hair and the type of jacket that I was wearing and this and that. And like my Chinese was good enough to understand it, but it wasn't good enough to really turn around and like talk to him about it. And I just kind of was just like, you know, <laughs> but you have to so, pick your battles, right? You know, if you're going to be on a long bus trip, you know, you don't want to set yourself up for having an argument or being thing. I, yeah. I had a similar thing for a long train ride, and this was the old style trains that were um, green train. you'd face it six 
three on one side, three on the other. You're facing with a, a table in the middle, you know, yeah. and uh, with my yeah. friend Pete going on a thing and these two girls. Uh, fortunately, they were it was like neutral, you know, they're like, oh, look at these guys. Oh, I like his hair. It's so brown. It's like, but what about the big nose? He's got a big nose, whatever they, yeah, but I think this guy's cute. It's a, oh, he's got a beard. Is he Russian? I think he's Russian because he's got a beard. You know, they look, yeah. look at really yeah, simple yeah, things yeah. and they're like, oh, it must be, uh, must be this stereotype or that stereotype, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, usually it's innocent. You know, they really don't think you speak any Chinese. And once you do speak a little bit of Chinese, it's like, yeah, cute, huh? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, uh oh, and then run away to the bathroom or something. And then, you know, <laughs> come back slowly and then have a, a fun trip later. You know, um, it's it's fun to do that kind of stuff. So a downside for me, and this is going back to what Austin said, being able to understand everything around you. So this is my experience. So I have a girlfriend and I, I go out with her friends a lot. We all know each other and I got some Chinese friends and uh, it's kind of like I'm accepted. They, they, they know who I am. But um, as soon as I go outside of that circle of friends or away from my girlfriend and everything, I hear all this, mm -hmm. why, 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 why go in, why go in? <laughs> and they always remind me, because I understand, always reminds me how I, I'm a foreigner. I, I can't completely fit in here. I'm just, I'm different, this and that. And mm -hmm. I don't want to hear that. I wish sometimes I could be accepted as normal, but that's not going to yeah. happen. Like last year when I went to Spain, and of course I can understand I speak Spanish, but I'm not from there. And mm -hmm. it felt great to fit in. I don't know how to explain this. It felt great to feel normal. It, it, it felt great. But here, because I understand everything, I'm constantly reminded of how I'm not uh, normal here. And sometimes I don't mm -hmm. like that feeling, especially if I wake up and we're human. If I wake up on the wrong side of the bed, I hate hearing that. Yeah. I hear that. Why, Grim? Why? Yeah. Yeah. And it has, I it has benefits and it has, you know, disadvantages. I mean, it is annoying to have like people point at you, which is happening less and less, at least here in Chengdu. Uh, when I first got here, and I'm sure when you, you guys have been all like OGs and stuff, you've been here for longer than I have, people would just, you know, point at you, take pictures, and it was strange, right? You're like monkeys for them but i think yeah. <laughs> right i mean it just it is what it is but i think it also gives you a lot of uh, benefits they cut you a lot of slack um if you make a mistake or something so i think there are pros and cons it does drive me crazy when people keep pointing out i'm a foreigner and i just want to blend in but yeah. um yeah. it does being a foreigner does allow us to have some wonderful opportunities so you take the good with the bad that's kind of how i see it yeah mm. yeah that's changed before yeah. like you'd be Stop for uh, going through a red light on your electric bike or something. And then, like, this is like 10 years ago. So maybe you could pretend, like, oh, I don't speak Chinese. Oh, did I go through a red light? Oh, what's going on? Blah, blah. And they let you off. Now they don't let you off. They're just like, okay, look, I have a WeChat translator. Look, <laughs> you need to pay 20 kwai for going through the red light. You know, this is how you do it. Did it you know, do it now or do it at the station. You're like, okay, you know. <laughs> Uh, can't, uh, can't use that excuse anymore. Another downside for me, and it's not really negative, but uh, is when my colleagues or my foreign friends ask me to, if like if we go out to a restaurant or anywhere, and they point at something Chinese that's really, really specific to Chinese culture or something, like what does that mean? And I'm trying to think how I can translate this and tell them what this is, but I have no idea. It's like I have to think of a paragraph to to translate like two or three <laughs> ideas or characters to them in Chinese. And the same thing in in uh, in. Uh, in Chinese, like uh, for, ex for example, my <laughs> my students, they're uh, they're young, and they're like, "Teacher, how do you say Beijing in English? How do you say Shanghai in English? How do you say Fushun?" Or oh, older Chinese, just giving you an example, how do you say this in English? And I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think like I just said of like an entire paragraph just to tell them the idea of just like a few words. <laughs> Have any yeah. of you guys ever done translation work where you had to go from one person to the other? Um, interpretation is called, I believe. I've, I've yeah, done it, like, fun, yeah. not professionally, just, you know, for fun. It is exhausting. Austin, have you it's done horrible. that? It's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> you, it's really fun for about 25 minutes. Right. And then, and then you just... Are you talking about simultaneous with the, the, the headphones and then the earpieces that they wear and then the people speaking and then you go 20 minutes, 20 minutes, that, that simultaneous? Yeah, or are you talking of consecutive? Because uh, I had a, as part of, I worked for the translation company for like a year and a half. And part of that, I uh, taught 
people how to do the consecutive translation. They call it whisper translation, where uh, one person speaks, you write it down, and then you translate to them. They speak, then you write it down, and then you, you, you speak to them, you know. And especially if you yeah, have time one. and uh, thing. It's, it, um, and the big thing about that is you don't actually have to know all the technical terms because most of the time they're like, oh, this is too long, this is too expensive, this is too cheap. And they repeat several things, even if you don't know what um, – or some of the things like agricultural uh, barn for animals is in Chinese, you know, like, but you, you can say the other other things around, you know, house, animal house, something like that, you know. Well, how do you <laughs> interpret things that are really specific to Chinese culture? How do you interpret that to, it, to someone, in uh, an English speaker? It's more like explaining a, a concept. Hmm. Like you just, yeah. like you can't, uh, like there just are no direct translations for something. So you have to just explain the idea behind it. You have to describe the idea. Like if you're talking about a chung yu, you know, you can't just directly translate a lot of chung yu. You have to explain the story. Like if I want to talk about like, I don't know, hu jia hu wei, like I have to like explain the entire story of the tiger and the fox and then like doing this. And then like, it's like using your powerful yeah. connections and like, yeah, it's just describing the idea. You have to yeah, take like a word and turn it into a definition for English speakers. Like I was telling my mother, it's like today for Dragon Festival, we ate zongzi. She's like, what's that? <laughs> I was like, well, it's uh, it's a type of traditional Chinese thing wrapped in a reed leaf and sometimes has this and that. She's like, why don't you just tell me what it is? I was like, mom. I am it, telling you what it is. There's no direct translation. You know? like, it's a zongzi. <laughs> she's like, it's just wants one uh, one word it's like actually right. a little it, it, it's especially difficult for like words that like for food or other things that don't exist in in the u.s you know yeah. certain types of uh uh crispy tofu and like well what's that you know <laughs> tofu, or it's like or um like, it's like marshmallow rice or something mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and you just have yeah. to like, try to adjust yeah. different ways but it's different you know and like in china for instance like green vegetables and spinach there's like eight or nine different types of spinach here. You know, it's really nice, you know, but it's hard to translate it exactly to the thing. It's a type of spinach. Just, it's good. Totally. It, you know. <laughs> yeah. I have some translation from some uh, translator friends and they said the most difficult stuff to translate, you can let me know, uh, Simon, if it's true or not, is jokes and idioms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't, take, you can't take a long time to like translate it. You'll be there all day long. So you kind of just like, he said a joke, please laugh. Yeah, like that. that's right. That's what <laughs> you do. Like, yeah, okay. it's a funny story about a rabbit running into a tree, and then the guy waiting in the underneath the tree for uh, for other rabbits to run into the tree and die. Something like that. You know. Please oh, laugh. Laugh, <laughs> laugh, 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 laugh. You know. Like, <laughs> and but and vice versa for the Chinese. Sometimes uh, U.S. people or other people will use like uh, a reference to like history or something. And, and it's it's just like when when Lincoln said uh, uh, the this, this union must be is stronger as a whole or something. It's like, he said something about Lincoln, just clap or something. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah. So what about this question? Uh, Simon, you're saying you were doing translation stuff. Did you have to go through all those studies or? No, or I did have the option after I did my master's in business in Chinese, I did have an option to do, um, uh, like interpretation uh, program and then it would feed into the uh, EU. So if you do get to a high level of Chinese, this is an option because uh, EU also, um, uh, they translate everything into English and then they translate from English out to the other languages. So if you have like a mother tongue English person who speaks Chinese, then that's very good for translating into English. You know, it's much easier to translate into your mother tone language yeah. than into your second language. Um, 100%. Uh, and also the uh, the main part of my work was uh, proofreading, um, and I, I was the it was a big company that did a lot of contracts and patents and things like that. So sometimes I'd have to go learn about like gas stove gas tops uh, and uh, washing machines to get some like background vocabulary. But it was generally um, checking uh, other people's translations and then talking about certain things. Occasionally they gave me like speeches from um, leaders of Chinese companies and they would like, in, in Chinese speeches, they like stress one word or one theme over and over again. 
uh, and sometimes it was really, <laughs> really a bad word or something, you know, like, uh, 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 what was something like ignorance, blah, 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 you know, but it was saying just, uh, the, what they meant to say was like perseverance or something, you know, like struggling, you know, yeah. not, not just not knowing about stuff. I was like, you may want to change this word, change this word, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, uh, I, it was a lot of also. I did some on on the job training at the company, and uh, and it, it, it yeah, uh, and I did have uh, a lot of training in Chinese before I took it. But for translation, oftentimes they like to have people who are have another skill, like the software programming or engineering, and then have like um, medium level. Uh, of Chinese so that they understand what they're talking about first and then they can express it, you know. So for um, the only thing about translation is you don't get to talk to people and you have to, it's time consuming and it's not very well paid, you know. Uh, if you can get the interpretation gigs and get a regular business on that, that can get be very well paid, but um, the hours are not consistent and it, it can be mm -hmm. difficult. So, um, so yeah, uh, my main thing was like translation, you're at a computer translating all the time and you're not talking with people. I'm a people person. And so that's why no, right. I, I the job, not that it was a bad job. Yeah, speaking of talking to people, let's let's get on to this one, okay? So as a perspective or experience of China before you could speak Chinese and after Chinese, like how, you know, how has that changed uh, or did it change? So what about you guys? Lawrence, how about you go first? What do you think? Oh, I'm trying to think about this one. All right, the perspective, experience of China. Yeah, so to learn the language, it's kind of like to learn the culture, right? So the more Chinese I learn, just the more I start to understand um, maybe how some people think. You know, just when you understand the language, you can really appreciate the culture more. So when I first came here, I really knew nothing about what was going on. And um, as I'm learning the language, I'm just understanding so much more because so much of the idioms, you know, the Chengyu and the idioms, um, Chengyu is just like a four, four character idiom. A lot of it goes back to, you know, Chinese history. So the more I learn, just the more aware of the culture I am and it changes my perspective uh, for the language and the culture mm. you know, all at once. It's all intertwined for me at least. Okay, yeah. so uh, for me, this uh, perspective, this experience, before I came to China, I had all the stereotypes in my mind. I mean, that's typical American stereotypes about China, I guess. Uh, so this was six years ago, and I had <laughs> I'm 35, and I'm still thinking like this. So people flying, running through trees. <laughs> They're really good. At that. <laughs> they, they all could do martial arts, all that crazy stuff. That's the only thing I knew about China, because before coming here, I didn't really pursue China on the news or actively look for it on uh, YouTube. It only came after I had the desire to learn Chinese. So uh, after I got here, I found out that, um, and after uh, learning Chinese to a good level, I found out that the people are from earth, just like us. And they have the, uh, even though the culture is different, they still have the common, the same common goals and desires as we do to provide for their family, to, uh, to uh, seek pleasure and not pain, to just live a good normal life. And of course, you can find out more things deeper as you learn the language, as Lawrence said. But <laughs> I had all those stereotypes in my mind before I came here. And but when I came after I came here, all those things were just totally wiped away. And I just see that Chinese people are uh, like everyone else, normal humans that want to live a good life. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think like learning, like learning to, to speak and be comfortable with with Chinese, it it really humanizes China. I think that's probably what I would say. Oh, it humanizes great, great your experience. It. Great way to put it. And, and um, also it really, it makes things just so much easier. Uh, you become independent for one thing. You can go out and take care of yourself. And you can connect with local people, like share little jokes. And like, you know, I remember like we all go, we all have our routine, right? We go to the same, maybe like little corner restaurant just outside your, your neighborhood. You know, you go there and you, you have little chit chats with the boss and, you know, uh, just make these little, these little friends and 
uh, and your independence. And it just like, there are all these small things that kind of come together and it completely shifts your experience. Like, yeah. especially when you first come, China's a really difficult place to get used to. Um, yes. I think so anyway. Like when yeah, you first yeah. arrive, all of the language is totally different. Like there's, there's like the culture is totally different. Um, there's your daily experience dealing with like bureaucracy and transactions is different. Everything's so different. <coughs> but then like when you start learning more and more of the language, then like Lawrence said, you kind of figure out the culture behind it. And then you kind of tune into the logic behind the way everything is done. And then it, it just makes everything so much better. Yeah. And like, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've noticed that the people who come to China and tend to like hate living in China and the people who leave tend to not speak any Chinese. Yeah. Like the people yeah. who really like China are the people who speak Chinese because they get yeah. it. And the people who don't like China don't speak Chinese. Totally. I, 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 totally. I agree. Yeah. Yes, I mean, yes. it's, it's crossover, but yeah, yeah, you're generally right. Also, Austin, I, I like to uh, strengthen the independent idea. You know, like uh, the first year in Suzhou, we'd go up. We lived in like the suburb of Suzhou, so it wasn't like built up. And so there were no English signs. And you'd be like, let's go see if we can find a restaurant. What, what, what shop is this? Oh, it's a tailor. Oh, it's a gadget shop. Oh, it's a restaurant. Yeah. Okay, let's go in here and do a restaurant. Like literally, you would not know what a shop was until you're right in front of a window looking into it. Yeah, you know? that's right. That, yeah. That's what it was like the, the first time we were there. And now, like, uh, we can use the, uh, an app to to search for stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I, it feels like after I think it was like the third year of studying, I had one thing where I was calling the movie theater to ask if it was the original version of Troy speaking or was it a dub version? And then I was able to do that. And I was like, yeah, oh man, I, I could ask about movies on the phone. It's unbelievable. <laughs> And uh, wow. even just recently, like uh, I've t uh, started doing um, uh, therapy, like psychotherapy in Chinese, you know, because uh, wow. all the English speaking people are in uh, Shanghai. And that's, this is really helpful. You know, you, it, it's stressful. And if you have two kids, it's, it's also stressful. So um, <laughs> I encourage people, uh, don't, don't think badly about psychotherapy. They're very useful. And, and uh, you can find qualified people in China um, to, to help you with these types of things. Um, you know, so uh, I, I, it's, it's not, oh, and one other thing, like I was able to start kind of clubs, you know, one of the things was the ultimate Frisbee club for Nanjing, you know, and then yes. I played a lot in college. Yes. Yeah, ultimate Frisbee. Uh, I, and, play, uh, I, played, I played a few days ago. It's the best. Local people love Frisbee. They just don't know it yet. Exactly, you yeah. know, um, yeah. but also like uh, ultimate Frisbee has a bit of a counter culture, uh, to it called spirit of the game where you see your opponents not as someone to beat but someone to to play with and uh, uh, push each other to reach to a higher heights and and they have like these no referee rules and stuff and it's 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 really communal and co-ed mm -hmm. and, and fun you know um, and uh, because I was able to speak Chinese I could teach people how to play and that really helped yep. and made, made me also yeah. feel like I accomplished like oh I'm giving back oh there's one other thing I I was part of a Rotary Club. This is like uh, raise money, uh, do charity events to raise money for for causes. But in China, we have to be really low key, and they don't allow us to um, publishize uh, it um, because it's a foreign organization. Anyway, but uh, we went to this migrant school, and at the beginning, we were like, uh, "We want to build you a library." And then school guy, all in Chinese, was saying. Um, uh, we don't need a library. Uh, come look. We have this nice big building, nice big uh, library built by the government. Uh, but we we mi miss missing some books. Uh, can you bring us some books? Can you have bring some uh, cultural uh, uh, events like uh, teach us some things about the West? And we're like, okay, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So we raise money for books and then like toothbrushes and then uh, like played baseball with them and 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 it was much much smoother because we didn't have the language barrier you know they still could have helped mm -hmm. them still could have done stuff but we probably would have built them a second library and and they would have been like eh, what do we need two libraries for you know no books <laughs> so okay. stuff like that is really helpful you know mm -hmm. there we go okay <laughs> so here's an interesting question 
I don't really, I don't know. I don't know what I think about this question. Any, any thoughts? Can you forget I, Chinese once you've learned it? I mean, decay, I, decay happens naturally with anything that you learn, right? It doesn't matter what it is. So just keep practicing. I think, uh, I think you can uh, forget some of it <clears throat> if over time you don't speak it. But I do believe, and because this happened with me with Spanish, if you haven't spoken for a while and you feel like you've forgotten it and you get back into that, say you were out of China for a year and then you come back, you'll pick it up quickly. You'll pick it up very fast. It'll come back really fast because I feel like it's still in your mind somewhere. And I feel like uh, what you know, you don't forget. And I just think that if uh, after time passes, you get back into it, you'll pick it back up. But I think you can forget some of it or you yeah. just can't bring it back out naturally again. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree with uh, Angelo that uh, especially um, when I was studying at the university, like I could write like paragraphs in Chinese and, and things like that very easily. Um, and now like the writing the characters just straight off, I have difficulty. I have to type the pronunciation and then pick the codes and, and type. So my typing has uh, uh, improved a lot. And then also uh, my French was at a high level before I came to China. Um, and then uh, in the summers, I would go back to uh, France and sometimes, and then it would come back. I would uh, have forgotten a whole lot, but after like a week of watching TV, French TV or interacting with French people, it would it would come back very quickly. So I, I, I do agree with you that it comes back, um, but there's certain parts like just writing the characters. Oh my God, it, 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 that, that, that'll, that's gonna be hard whenever you learn it. Do you agree? I don't know. Do yeah. you, I, I, do, I, I do find you, characters one of the hardest part of China, Chinese. Do right? you guys actually like, well, uh, apparently Simon does, but do you guys actually like write Chinese like by hand ever? Yeah. I don't. You don't? I don't write my name. <laughs> no. It's all how, do you, you, how do you take notes? Dude, I got I technology. Just, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pinyin Rufa. Like, that's yeah, it. Like, no, Rufa. I never write Chinese. Really? Never. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I spend more time <laughs> typing it. No, I, I agree. It's like a huge time grab to learn how to write. Like I'm not a fluent writer. Like I don't have, you know, thousands and thousands of characters that I can just write by hand very neatly. I could do maybe about a 500, a thousand, no problem. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's still important though to know how to write. Maybe not every single character, but uh, I mean, I use it. I make notes all the time. I, I've I, lost I know, a lot of my knew, handwriting ability. I mean, I can recognize, I can type, and and that one. Uh, but I th I do agree that you lose it. And also Chinese people, a lot of Chinese, right. all the Chinese people, they forget how to write it, or they're like, oh, let me double check. Is it uh, Ren Zipong or Mu Zipong or something? You know, yeah. like, what is this? Because part of the letter is the meaning, and another part is sometimes the pronunciation. And then there's, uh, you know, it just depends on what the character's meaning and stuff like that. So for me, um, it's yeah, my, my wife doesn't. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say for me now, still, it is very difficult for me to read handwritten Chinese. Uh, it's Same. so hard for yeah. me to read. Yeah. <laughs> so difficult. So, so, so difficult to read handwritten. Yeah. Here's and my right. wife's handwriting. Uh, yeah. Wow. Feng Wen Yan. Is the first one Feng? Feng. I could, yeah. yeah, that looks like phone. Is that phone? You, the you second one, when, yeah. When, when jo, uh, yeah. So, phone, when, when jo, uh, nigga, uh, uh, ke maybe is that one? Uh, so it says phone, phone, when, yeah, it's a, uh, oh. <laughs> it's you a were really close, Lauren. <laughs> it's a mian. You were really close. Yeah, phone, when, yeah, it's like, cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go to the, the doctor in a week or so. So we were writing down phone numbers. So this is a, Medical one. So if you didn't get it, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Hand, handwritten is so difficult. I mean, it could be a very simple yeah. character, and if it's written like handwritten style, you know. Yeah, let me think <laughs> of my, uh, for my Chinese no, colleagues, they still find it difficult to read uh, English cursive writing. They can't yeah. read it. English totally. cursive. Writing. Yeah. Totally. Uh, see if I have any more. Well, okay, don't worry, it's, it's, it's okay. We don't have to have a test. I was, was, <laughs> was going to test you guys. We're going to test you guys. So wait, hold on one second. Hold on. I saw I saw a comment. I have to address. Um, is it possible to pass HSK four no. without knowing characters? No. 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 There's no pinion. There's yeah. It's it's a hundred percent characters. 
So uh, you can't do that. HSK3 uh, actually you need characters for. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, at least basic characters, you know, at least be yeah. able to read yeah. and recognize them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah HSK1 you have to... and 2, you don't, need, you don't need them, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's just recognized, basically. Yeah. You don't have to know how to handwrite because the right. HSK is now all on computers. Yeah. So you just type, type the pinion and then they'll all come up. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Reading uh, is very important. The writing aspect is much more difficult, but by HSK four, you should be able to read, you know, thousands of characters, you know. But it doesn't mean yeah. you have to produce it by memory exactly how to write each character, but you need to know how to recognize it and how to read it. Yeah. And yeah, and for the exactly. HSK, like also the cutoff points are usually like uh four and six and like nine and stuff. Uh, so if you oh, can God, get up to it. HSK six. <laughs> oh, puncture! Oh, puncture! Puncture! Oh. That's right. That's right. That's okay, right. sorry. <laughs> I thought it sounded weird, but I didn't want to admit it. I thought it Feng Wen sounded weird. So What's yeah, that? thank you for that. Yeah. What it's is that? hard for me to read the written. Yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, like Nei means like your immune system. Uh, puncture. I think it's. Yeah, well, I mean, we can. Yeah, we can, yeah. we can well, I looked at uh, rheumatism. <laughs> rheumatism. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Rheumatism. Because uh, because I I have um I have it. gout, which is a type of arthritis, and it falls under that particular category. So under auto autoimmune and rheumat rheumatoid stuff and all that. So that's why um we were. This is a good example it. of how Chinese also makes you humble. You know. Um, yeah. And uh, totally. because there's lots of these technical, like if it's a medical term, there's maybe have characters from the normal uh, speech, but it, it's used in a different context and the meaning will be different, you know? Um, yeah. And uh, uh, learning Chinese has really made me humble and uh, made me feel like I can learn anything, but uh, at the same time, realize that how big Chinese is and how much uh, Chung Yu and history is part of the language. And uh, yeah, just, Take it one step at a time and don't boast to anybody that you're fluent or anything like that, even if you have a high level. Right, exactly. Totally agree. Because the second that you say you're really good at Chinese, someone's going to mm. bust out something that you don't understand. <laughs> because, exactly. Because, and this has happened to every single one of you. This has happened to every single one of you. Whenever you were first learning Chinese and you were saying something, or maybe even you were intermediate, the Chinese person you were talking to says like, oh, wow, your Chinese is so good. And in the very next sentence they say, you don't have a clue what they said. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Because so, I was very good at saying, I'm fine, thank you, and you. Well, good, how, Nina, you know, or something. Yeah. It's very yeah. humbling for sure. It's like, it, it's so humbling. I think you said it perfectly. And I wish you the best of luck, uh, Ayer, Ayer Tol yes. Toluki. I don't know how to say that name, but uh, I'm sure you did fine, you know. I'm sure you did fine. Yeah, you'll be all right. HSK is so, rough, but I'm sure you'll be great. So, And you can um, take it more than once. There's no limit, you know. Yeah. You can keep taking it several right. times. It's fine, you know. <laughs> so um, we're getting close to the hour and a half mark, so let's do this. We're going to... I think it'd be good to take a few questions. If people have any questions um, just about Chinese, Mandarin, dialect, uh, learning, uh, resources, if you have any questions at all, like put them, put them in the, uh, in the comment section and we'll, we'll talk about them. We'll start with snarky. So uh, yeah, I have a Chinese, if I'm going to move to Hong Kong in a few years, should I adjust my focus on Cantonese or continue Cantonese. in Mandarin? Cantonese, um, totally. If you're going to Hong Kong, you know, either speak English or Cantonese, I would say in most settings. Um, yes. The last time I was in Hong Kong, I had a similar experience to uh, Austin uh, where I was speaking Mandarin to the shopkeepers and, and my wife was speaking Mandarin to the people and they did not have a good uh, reaction to that. Um, so I would say either English or uh, Cantonese. And I'm starting to learn some Cantonese now it is a beautiful language, and I think you'd have so much fun with really? it. It is. Ooh. 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 Ooh.
Oh, hey, <laughs> but Lawrence, oh, I, I think yeah. it also depends on uh, on what the job is. You know, if you're just like hanging out with the local people, I think Snarky like walks around and eats the food and chats people up. Then yes, the Cantonese because. Uh, they prefer Cantonese and English to to Mandarin, which they learn in school. But if it's uh, for business, like international trade, and then they have Mandarin stuff where they'll be talk also interacting with Taiwan and Singapore and Malaysia, you know, they are, they're also much more on uh, Mandarin now. You know, Singa yeah. Singapore yeah. and Taiwan, they, they're still much more on, on Mandarin. And that's the Guoyu, the international Chinese uh, business language. Uh, totally. that I would talk about. And because it's a banking center, a lot of people do, are there for banking and trade and stuff like that. So it just depends. Average rate Next for a question. Mandarin tutor. Hmm. Where, in China? I've never, I've never, <laughs> I've never had a Mandarin tutor. I, Maybe I don't know. 100, 150 uh, RMB, of course. Like 100, 150 RMB per hour. Yeah. Sounds about right. No, I don't think so. No, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it also depends if you the qualifications of the person and uh, are they with a big brand and then you you're studying abroad and inside. But if you are here, uh, I think you know a graduate student who's studying at a university wants a part time job on the side. I think you know like fifty to like eighty quai or something like that. You know, fifty to um, eighty quai. That's gonna be rough. If that's, you can find it, ooh. 50 quai is rough. Yeah, it's hard to find. You I can think never find that in Chengdu. You can never yeah. find that in Chengdu. I think 100 if is um, a very fair price. If you get like a bunch of lessons, you get kind of like a bulk discount. I think 100 is pretty decent. 50 is hard. So Yeah. I had a Chinese person uh, teaching me Japanese to get ready for my Jap uh, trip to Japan. And I paid her 1,000 renminbi a month. How many classes? Mm. Just a month. It was uh, four classes a week. Wow. So every, oh, like well, every that's, other day. That's, that's really nice. That's, that's very great. cheap up here. It was very nice. And she was very professional and everything. So it was a good experience. Just a thousand a month. Wow. Mm. For 16 classes. Next question. Great. Yeah. Mm. Besides learning conversational Mandarin, did you guys focus on vocabulary from a certain field? Yes. Yes. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> so I focused on vocabulary from my passions and my hobbies, things that I really, really, really like. For example, uh, heck, um, traveling, video games. And I also love to watch um, – I love uh, watching uh, things about mansions and big, nice houses and stuff on YouTube and stuff. So all those things that I really liked, that I, that I like, that I follow, I learned vocabulary and um, – ways to say things about those things because I'm motivated to learn them. I'm very interested in them and I will learn them because I won't find them boring. So this, I'm not talking yep. about a professional sense, like being a doctor yep. or something, just certain field passions, hobbies. That's what I've learned a lot of Mandarin from. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll just quickly agree with that. Yeah. It's just stuff I'm interested in. Like, for example, I'm going to buy uh, a new camera next week and uh, it's a Sony camera. And I'm buying it at a shop in China, so there's no English interface on the camera. Uh, so I've got to learn all of the camera terms in Chinese. So, like, that's just one example. Yeah. 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 I do something similar. When I go to an environment, um, like I went to a dentist yesterday. So before I went, I just quickly searched um, some specialized words, like how to say your gums are, you know, recessing or something like that. And I just search it real quick. So when I would go there, I would know what to listen for. You know, yeah. no, I think uh, yeah. that's a great technique, uh, Lawrence. Uh, when I was in Sujo the first year, I would also have the, the tutor go through certain dialogues, you know, and also we walk around and be like, what's that? That's light post. What's this? God, God office, you know, or something like this. So that uh, yeah. you would learn yeah. stuff that uh, you're actually interacting with and go down like uh, in the... Uh, um, Restaurant, say I've learned to spicy chili peppers or something, or uh, is this sweet or is this uh, savory? Something like that, and then um, you'll be able to be meaningful. You know what I mean? Um, after, uh, Are we all breaking really bad? Yeah. Are we all breaking really bad or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. Can you can rock. Yeah. 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 Industry. Industry. Uh -oh. Industry. 
I think we're going to okay. end three, right? Third time, man. Third time, man. Uh, it was great to talk to you guys. It's been really good. Yeah, it's been fun, guys. I think the stream is ending. I can't tell as I can't hear anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Oh, we lost, uh, yep. We lost him. Oh, well. So, uh, yeah, I think we should probably end the stream here. Ah, oh, he's back. Okay. Um, but, yeah, it's, been, it's an hour and a half. So, I think that's all the time. So, Thank you all uh, for coming on. It's been great talking to you. And uh, I'll make sure to put everyone's uh, links in the channel or in the description and everything. And um, Lawrence is at Hi Lawrence. If they handle it, it's at Angelo.com. You can see. And then James Simon, I had challenges. It is to name, so you can go over all of them. Like right now, and um, yeah, thank you guys again. Uh, just uh, in here, did anybody say anything? I can't say anything because I didn't hear much of what you just said, so I guess I'll just say, <laughs> See you guys, <laughs> thanks. Okay, I get, it was really right. choppy. Talk Sorry, all right, see you guys. <laughs> thank you guys so okay. much for listening. Right. Thank you, bye. Right. Take care, bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Let me just pull. Okay.